मॉर्निंग प्रज्वली पूर्णिमा गुड मॉर्निंग अनुजा कल्याणी गुड मॉर्निंग युवा गुड मॉर्निंग मिताली शर्मा गुड मॉर्निंग सुहर्ष गुड मॉर्निंग कृति पाटिल गुड मॉर्निंग प्रवीण गुड मॉर्निंग गौरव गुड मॉर्निंग मानसी गुड मॉर्निंग तेजस गुड मॉर्निंग हर्षदा पाटिल गुड मॉर्निंग विजय गुड मॉर्निंग आचल गुड मॉर्निंग स्वरदा गुड मॉर्निंग बिनी गुड मॉर्निंग प्राची गुड मॉर्निंग आचल गुड मॉर्निंग यू हैड प्रॉब्लम्स विथ योर क्रेडेंशियल्स आई एम कमिंग टू दैट टुडे अक्षय रेड़कर गुड मॉर्निंग अजय अर्जुन गुड मॉर्निंग रसिका गुड मॉर्निंग अभिषेक गुड मॉर्निंग हर्षल गुड मॉर्निंग सौरभ सौरभ सॉरी गुड मॉर्निंग दुर्वेश गुड मॉर्निंग साहिल गुड मॉर्निंग एंड रितेश गुड मॉर्निंग टू यू ऑल फर्स्ट थिंग्स फॉर्स मैत्री पटेल गुड मॉर्निंग एंड टेक दिस एज द लास्ट वन फर्स्ट थिंग्स फर्स आशुतोष गुड मॉर्निंग फर्स्ट थिंग्स फर्स्ट येस्टरडे द वाइस प्रिंसिपल सायंस professor uh, dewte posted a list of uh, the credentials for the first year bsc students uh, he had uh, posted a message after that that if you don't find your name in that particular list you should be uh, forwarding your details to him and he would see that in the next round chinmay good morning uh, in the next round he would get your credentials also there was a problem with one of the girls she said that this is not her gmail id let me tell you that these credentials it is like your official id to be on an online platform online program of the college this is what you have to remember and why are these important uh, probably maximum by next week i am shifting to uh, google suit and there you will see that a lot of things would be streamlined say for example it's time that you know of your assignments also uh, so a submission of assignments if you want to say take some tests as such okay uh, sarthak good morning chinmay good morning uh, in all these issues okay it could be recorded at one particular place and uh, these are this is a licensed copy that the college has obtained from uh, say say in 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 uh, interaction with google and uh, let me tell you that as far as these license copies are concerned uh, unlike other google meets uh, we can record our lectures there and uh, uh, in between avinash good morning in between there were issues as far as non clarity as far as streamyard is concerned but as i said right at the start that this was an option we had uh, initially and uh, the earlier we switched the better and so finally the college has finalized google suits or g suits and uh, we require to sh shift there and for you all to be shifting there and officially being members there you need to have your own credentials also not that if you don't have your credentials you will not be allowed in the class as such but uh, it's better that you have your credentials at the earliest because you may be att able to attend lectures but when it comes to submission of assignments you may not be able to without your credentials so uh see that you you obtain your credentials at the earliest from uh, the college there is one more thing that i wanted to share with you all i don't know how many of you all have uh, have have attended my lecture on moocs or any other issues as such moocs you have international moocs you have national moocs also now uh, many a time some of the moocs massive open online courses uh, they give you concessions if you are a student if you belong to a particular college uh but something else that they require is your official college id as such if you have an official email id then uh, they they grant you concessions up to 50% as far as a particular mooc course is concerned so uh, <clears throat> there again your 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 credentials are going to be very very important and uh, god forbid if such conditions continue or reoccur in the next year and the year after that these credentials are going to be very handy see that you don't forget your username also see that uh, you change your password once you get or even if you register it 
and uh, keep that password uh, very carefully because it becomes very difficult because the password said message will not come to you it will go to the college admin as such so this is going to be a long process if you forget it now does that mean that you don't have your own uh, gmail id yes your G own gmail id continues to stay as it is anjali good morning uh, uh, your 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 gmail id continues and you can use it for your personal things uh, as such this is going to be your college id okay you can store your notes here on the drive you can store uh, other issues you can so you can you can exchange practicals uh, sheets uh, with each other <coughs> eventually and as time goes we will be uh, more skilled in handling our uh, specified or i would say uh, um, uh, Google account which comes out of our credit credentials as such. So uh, these are the benefits we are going to have initially uh, at the outset, and uh, uh, there are there are obviously more to follow. Okay, um, it is believed that at least by this month end, online or oh, sorry, offline college will not be taking place. So we will have to wait and watch what uh, what directions come from the various levels of the government central state and local government as such as to when uh, we should be attending our college uh, campus as such. a very unfortunate thing to happen with a generation like y'all uh, with nearly six months gone without y'all being aditya good morning without y'all being there on the on on the college because i i personally believe that as far as college campuses college classrooms and college environments are concerned it's not only the classroom that uh, you learn from you learn otherwise also uh, uh, otherwise also in fact you learn with your friends you learn with uh, you, you you develop into groups you have practical batches and you have so many people to look around and follow and copy imitate or not imitate okay you'll see that the better persons you tend to see you 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 say to your mind that yes i want to be like this guy i i don't want to be like this guy all this happens when you interact and college is a, a protected environment where you can interact freely with uh, your friends in the class and otherwise in other faculties also you can be a part of various activities which unfortunately are not happening i i believe it's only the vaad sabha to quite an extent which is conducting online things uh, happening around uh, around us very soon we are launching our uh, say say brochures with regards the um, state level competition that we tend to have the puga sastra buddhi allocation competition as uh, as such uh, yeah coming to this thing that akshata is asking us means do we have to change our password from student 1 to 3 to something else yes it is advisable because anyone else you'll see that the, the credentials are a public document right the principal vice principal had posted it on the group so anybody could just hack into your thing or, or into your uh, uh, account so it's better it's better okay if you are it's difficult for you to remember passwords if you already have a lot of passwords and if you are not going to share much as far as that account is concerned it is fine but as far as online is concerned good morning mayur um, online issues are concerned we don't know how people could get mad and how they could uh, say say wrongly use your identity uh, as such okay just imagine i log in from your account and i post some bad words or or say extra good words to a student or to a teacher as such okay that would that would fetch a lot of problems of course problems tend to get solved but then the tension etc is going to be there so it's advisable that that you change your um, password from student at the rate 1 2 3 2 2 so any preferable password you would like to have uh, which would not be easily hacked as such uh, so it becomes a secure account for you and you could utilize it remember you are going to be with it possibly for the next 3 years so uh, it's it's advisable that we we maintain that uh, that is as far as uh, uh, initial sharing is concerned uh, then uh, as far as syllabus is concerned i have been posting the syllabus and uh, as far as your internals are concerned you are going to have an mcq internal that's going to be next month uh, you are going to have internal submission of assignments uh, that you would be we would be taking up soon now uh, today and tomorrow we are going to have our le regular lecture you are going to let me know uh, what is the best time in the evening that we can meet on google because uh, just like we saw that movie on national geographic i think uh, 
uh, as far as the history of the earth is concerned geological history of the earth is concerned uh, we we did complete that isn't it uh, and uh, having completed that there is one more uh, that we need to look into i don't know how many of you all have watched the movie or i would rather say it's a movie but it's an educational documentary to uh, which was released in 2009 home h o m e you can still search for it on google and you have it as well uh but there are many versions of it i've fetched one of that and uh, it runs into 2 hours literally 1 hour and 59 minutes it's very important for a geography student and more important for us as human beings on the surface of this particular planet uh our assignments are going to be related to one the geological history of the earth that we have already seen and the second one is the home okay and uh i i, I have no doubts that you could you could uh Uh, watch it on your own also, but uh, the problem could be. Uh, I I normally what I do is I share a, a, a few comments when I am actually discussing it with uh, when when we are watching it together. That's what I did with my uh, FYBA class as well. So it gives you a, a a further insight into how a geographer and how actually a student should be looking at that particular uh, documentary uh, as such. And in that context. i would uh, rather say we watch it together and i would require uh, say two sessions of one hour each let us say we'll not go directly into uh, any of them uh, or say or the whole of the documentary uh, should not be i i am of a personal belief that it should not be watched at a stretch because uh, there are so many things involved that things need to seep in one by one one by one and that's why i always advise that i require two sessions of one hour each in fact uh as far as ba classes were concerned it it eventually the students were so interactive and they had so many questions uh, during the documentary also and 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 this encouraged me and i shared a lot of information with them as well uh as a consequence we we went into watch in for 3 days 3 sessions of 3 days as such. um that's uh, that's the second thing and the third thing is if you remember i had posted a a, a talk of uh, carl safin on oceanography okay the problems of the ocean as such okay uh, i don't know how many of you all have been sincere enough to watch it on your own if not uh, i would like to watch it with you all as well so uh, we i would be requiring three sessions in the evening uh, i will go by the majority and those who would be more interested i would not wait for the whole class to respond if majority of the students say that okay sir 6 o'clock 6:30 7 o'clock in the evening is fine with us i will create a google link and it is on this google link that we would be watching it and i would be sharing my views you could put in your contributions uh, is is how we need to go once we have finished with it i will tell you how we are going to transpire it into a assignment and that's uh, let me tell you that's going to be very interesting okay i i won't tax you with learning things as such it's going to be something that's going that 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 happens on the way okay i i believe that learning is is a process of acceptance and n- rather not a process of thrusting something on someone uh so i'm very sure that you would be enjoying it as well i'll give you tips and uh trims how as how to uh, go about i'll 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 give you a structured format of how your uh, uh assignment needs to be because i have to mark you for what uh, you would have um 15 marks of internal assessment of which five needs to be done on internal uh, uh internal assessment okay and and we'll go into the details of how that needs to be done uh when we have watched it so after by say by the end of this lecture or after we finish with this lecture you can we can just uh, come up with discussion as to what time should we be watching it uh let me tell you that uh, tuesdays uh, sorry uh, wednesdays uh you are busy but i would be comparatively free in the uh, mornings also otherwise monday tuesday and thursday friday saturday <coughs> i have my first year lectures and uh, say by next week i would be starting my uh, post graduate lectures also so uh, in that context uh, i believe that evening times particularly after 6 o'clock why i say after 6 o'clock is uh, uh, because you'll see that you get a better connectivity after 6 Okay, throughout the day, literally the whole world, even today, is is heavily stuck to the um, internet, and as a consequence, it becomes uh, uh, heavy for for particularly if we are uh, into a tie up with someone 
who is not that good as far as uh, I'm not, I'll not name uh, mobile companies, mobile in the sense, internet providing companies as such, but otherwise. So on the safer side, after six o'clock is going to be fine. So let me tell you, I know students would have their other classes and other commitments. Uh, but as I said that this is going to be, uh, say, 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 available on the net also. It's only that if you if you watch it with me, I would give you a further perception is, into it uh, as as a student of science and otherwise also. Uh, with it's only that context that I would I would wish that you watch it with me. And in, in all that, and I at least believe that 35 to 40% of the students that around, that means around 50 students would be watching it with me. Uh, if the number source, of course, I have no objections. Uh, what does Shreyas says? Shreyas says that, no, sir, not after six on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I don't know what problem Shreyas has, but uh, we could discuss it on the group uh, later on. And, uh, um uh, say 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 one day here and one day there say for example one day on wednesday and one day on thursday uh, could be could be fine with me uh we'll 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 obviously still discuss about it uh in uh detail later we have already used up 16 minutes of this lecture uh we need to go into our business uh, to our business end and uh, let me come to the business end as such yeah last time we spoke about uh geomorphology and what all geomorphology includes and in fact your whole syllabus is the first paper in fact is all about uh, geomorphology um, we started from basics of uh, geography and then the branches of geography and in physical geography a branch being geomorphology and then last time we went into the details of geomorphology as to how geomorphology is exclusively what happens on the land on on the land surface now what actually happens we have seen it last time that there are forces from the interior of the earth which build up the crust and of course there are forces from the exterior which polish this and that leads to various types of landform what are these forces and what are these events that happen you'll see that you have sudden forces or sudden events like earthquakes and and volcanoes which actually happen to be a part of your second topic we are not going to touch it immediately as such because we need to do something which is there in the third topic before that uh so so earthquakes and volcanoes on the one side which are rapid and sudden on the other hand you have uh, diastrophic movements uh, uh like 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 uh, folding and faulting you're going to go into the details of that also which is again part of your second uh unit of our syllabus for the first uh, first semester paper one and uh, Something which we already also have to do is the hypsometric curve, uh, which is uh, another interesting way of looking into uh, land and water on this particular planet. But as I said that uh, we, we, we spoke about the interior of the earth, didn't we? We spoke about the various layers and how these layers differ in density and of course thickness also. You'll see that the crust is very, very narrow. The mantle is significantly thick and of course the core is further thick, further divided into two parts and so on and so forth. We spoke about the temperatures and we spoke about the discontinuities within the, man within the various layers and between the layers also. And uh, we spoke about how earthquakes uh, or rather the waves, the earthquake waves have been responsible for us as far as the study of the interior of the earth is concerned. We spoke about seismic uh, seismographs and, and, and we spoke about uh, the shadow zone and so on and so forth. Okay, um, we, we, we uh, in geomorphology, as I said, we further go into the other part. Okay, All these are, are, are called as constructive forces for the earth basically because uh, they do construct the crust for the particular earth. Now, someone who polishes the crust is involves a lot of elements which have water in it. In the sense, you have rain directly which drops onto the surface and you have the course of a river and the river is going to have erosional and depositional features. We're going to come to that uh, as, as a last topic as far as the semester is concerned. Um, we could relate what we have learned in river to other in the sense the water in the river when you freeze it it's going to become a glacier and the glacier just like river water is operated by gravity the glacier is also operated by gravity and on the way the glacier is going to carve out the uh, various features we're going to have various sizes the scale of glacier is going to be uh, different as well okay this very water when it's going to seep down into the subsurface and move as uh, groundwater uh, that leads to cast and, and and of course this water this water in a saline form where it's limited to 
the coastal areas the sea level as such okay in that case again uh, it it plays a different role so uh, four agents okay river glacier wind waves and uh, ground water all of that all of these four are related to water somewhere or the other and then where you don't have water at all comes the fifth one that's wind okay let me tell you the processes remain the same the intensity changes with the agent all these agents are in a continuous job of polishing the crust okay had we had only ex exogenic forces the earth would have been very very smooth or on the other hand had we had only endogenic forces operating the earth would have been very uh, porcupiney i would rather say it would have had spikes everywhere but it's neither way it's a balance it tends to go towards an equilibrium and if you remember we spoke about the graded profile of a river and other forms of equilibrium in the last lecture as yes. Uh, by the way, uh, students do keep asking me where where to get notes, etc. I've already posted uh, the reference books, and let me tell you that uh, all the lectures that uh, I have I do conduct are recorded on YouTube on my channel. You can visit, and I have posted them as per dates. So, and and there are only two lectures presently. Eventually, you may we may have others, but presently you have only FYBA lectures and FYBSC lectures. They are not much different, but it is better that you follow your own faculty. And uh, while you are doing that, okay, day by day, you could just go and and you don't have to watch it at a normal pace. You could just uh, fast forward a bit, it a bit, and uh, you could take on what we are doing. As besides that, the the PPTs that I show you all are posted in the group also. So I don't think there should be a problem. Uh, even if you don't have a textbook and you would still want to say that no sir we are still in the habit of 11th and 12th standard i keep on repeating that this is under graduation and uh, your hab you have to change your habits not as far as learning is concerned but as far as reference is concerned 11th and 12th you had those textbooks but i would advise you all for all subjects now onwards try to look into reference books so that you understand a broader the that very topic in a broader context as such Finally, coming to the slide which is in front of you, how do we know anything about the Earth? Okay, we we one thing we have already done: interior structure, how the Earth is is divided into layers, etc., is how we learn about the interior. Volcanoes and hot spots do help us in learning the uh, details as far as the interior of the Earth is concerned. Earthquakes also help us. And uh, then we come to something is which is which is off late the the in thing I would say as far as learning about the uh, earth as uh, the tectonic plate tectonic motions. But what we have come down to today is something that has walked up a long period in history, and that is why reconstruction into the earth's history becomes very very uh, important, or I would rather say equally important as such. And as a consequence, we need to go into the details of that uh, as uh, as well. Okay, so uh, as far as these issues are concerned, uh, how do we go into the various theories as far as crust building? I call them as theories of crust building. Uh, there are various theories, but uh, as I said, when we speak about the origin of the earth, we saw that in the documentary also, that how pieces from the space, they, they I would say billions and billions of pieces, they, they got accumulated and then uh, it, it shaped into the earth and how what happened after that is obviously there in the National Geography documentary that we have seen the last time. But uh, it, it uh, the documentary also mentions that there was a period wherein it rained heavily for several millions of years to fill up all the underlying areas of the world and uh, thus leading to the formation of uh, uh, the so-called oceans of the day as such. And this distribution of oceans and land on the surface of this particular planet is uh, uh, is, is is called as uh, the hypsographic or hypsometric curve. Those who are anxious and excited about what, what hypsometric and hypsographic curves, I think a CBSC textbook have is but has it. But then those who have been following SSC, I don't think you may have done hypsometric or hypsographic curve. If you have not done that. It's there, I think, in the 11th standard or 12th standard book. I'm not very sure. But if it's not there, you could visit the Google and just type hypsometric curve and you'll get diagrams of this. And it, it, it speaks in detail about uh, how much of land is available above the mean sea level, what is uh, below that. Of course, we are going to uh, visit hypsometric curve as a topic later. 
on understanding how much of land how much of water what height etc is important and that is why it is a part of your syllabus as uh, uh, as such but coming to reconstruction of the earth's history you can see that um, there have been various scientists who have been looking at uh, these in the earth in various ways in the sense if you remember the 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 documentary on the history of the earth of the geological history of the earth how different scientists thought about it in a different way and so on and so forth but eventually when it comes to formation of uh, uh, so to say the um earth in itself okay it is believed that uh, it was it was it started somewhere in the 19th century itself not before that around 1875 Okay, you have this person called by the name Lothian Green, L O T H I A N G R E E N Green, as such, and uh, he comes up with a theory as far as the shape and etc. of the Earth is concerned, saying that uh, uh, the Earth is a tetrahedron. Now, what exactly does a tetrahedron mean? Okay, I am very sure that you all, being students of science, uh, would be in a position to uh, tell me what a tetrahedron is, but since Uh, as i said we have not yet shifted to g suits and we are not able to interact i would let you know for the benefit of the others as well that a tetra basically means four sided object tetra and 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 what does a hydron mean it's it's very similar to a pyramid now what is the difference between a pyramid shape and a tetrahedron a pyramid is four triangles isn't it four triangles on all sides and the base is a square four triangles and the base is square so how many faces do you have you have five faces you, you don't call it a tetra that's the basic difference between a pyramid and a tetrahedron but what do you do in a tetrahedron you take four equilateral triangles okay four equilateral triangles and you fix them into each other in such a way in such a way that it it develops into a tetrahedron you have a tetrahedron structure in chemistry organic chemistry as such uh, but even if you don't okay once again the the best source that the present generation has is google go to google search for tetrahedron and you'll get that tetrahedron shape it's basically a triangle with uh, four four faces and of course it's going to have uh, uh, four apices okay apex or apices as such uh, now green says that the earth is an inverted tetrahedron inverted okay you'll see that the pyramid is like this isn't it Okay, but he said, or the pyramid is like this. He says that a tetrahedron is an inverted thing. Okay, the 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 this apex is in fact the other way around. Okay, and he says that it's very easy to look at the earth. How do you look at the earth? He says that uh, you'll see that the apex of all these, all of all the tetra tetrahedron, the pieces of all the four uh, four pieces of the tetrahedron uh, are are land continents, and the faces, the face of the tetrahedron is our oceans okay so he says that if it is inverted the top surface is going to be ocean he says that the arctic ocean one face is the pacific ocean one face is the indian ocean and the third face is obviously the uh, atlantic ocean as is indian atlantic and pacific and of course at the top you have the arctic ocean okay the apexes the bottom axis uh, apex is uh, he says uh, the 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 antarctic continent and then you have the american continents the asian continents the eurasian continents and the african continents is his theory as yes. initially it caught uh, the imagination of many scientists and uh, uh, people were impressed by what he was saying but uh, when we came into the geometry of that okay people objected saying that see any geometric shape has to be stable isn't it when you put it on the ground it has to be stable now if you are taking a pyramid or a tetrahedron and and in fact you are inverting it how do you make it stand how do you make it stable was the basic question and this was the question that green was not able to answer and of course there were other things which went into <coughs> uh, say say the the aspects of criticizing his particular theory was concerned so very soon uh, the green theory of tetrahedron the tetrahedral uh, theory uh, it, it faded away into history yes sir you see that in between you have the theory of isostasy i'm referring to isostasy basically because we have it as one of the theories that we have to learn as far as the third unit uh, is of of your this paper is concerned as uh we are we see we we need to understand the other parts before we come to isostasy 
because it's a pit complex, I would rather say. And then comes the start of the 20th century and the first decade goes by and then you come to 1912, which is 108 years ago. You have a person called uh, by the name um, Alfred Wegener. And he comes up with a theory which is called as the continental drift. And uh, if, I, if I just go into a bit of fast forward, I would help you that this, this presentation would help us in that fast forward. You'll see that uh, we could start with the interior of the earth, uh, the crust of it. Uh, what are the violent uh, phenomena from the interior? Of course, you have volcanoes and then you have earthquakes and you'll see that these earthquakes, the various things that we spoke about, focus and the epicenter and the fault scar and the wave fronts and of course the fault along which the crack along which these blocks of the earth are going to move as such so these play an important role in carving out the surface as such and that is why they are called as uh, constructive forces though they would be destructive in the human sense of it earthquakes you'll see that it's happening here just okay it's happening here but you'll see that it leads to the uh, column of the uh, water being pushed up and obviously you're going to have a tsunami where of course this the, the shallowness of the water is not able to accommodate this much of energy and this energy pushes the water onto the surface as such so that is as far as the the, the oceanic impact of earthquake is concerned and uh, we come to a map which helps us to understand where all on this planet do earthquakes occur regularly now we'll keep this in front of us and then we'll go back to what Wegener had to say. All that Wegener had to say is going to be discussed in detail at uh, in, uh, in in eventually. But you'll see that uh, it took some time for Wegener's theory to be accepted because he gave it in German in 1912. It got translated into English way after, way after the decade 1924. And then uh, you had a lot of discussions on that and criticisms and favoritisms and so on and so forth. And... Uh, uh, in, in all that process, uh, Wegener was a very prolific traveler and uh, it is believed that somewhere in Iceland or Greenland, I'm not very sure, we'll see it in some movie some, some, at some point, other point of time. But uh, it so happened that he lost his way and uh, he say, say he, uh, was, was, he, he died in one of the uh, snowstorms, you could say. And his theory was not accepted. But... Uh, it, 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 it was a seed into the minds of many scientists as to why, what Wegener is saying, is it actually possible? And then the developments that happened during the Second World War and in uh, all that phase comes the phase of what is called as paleomagnetism. I'm going to come to the details of what all this is. You have paleomagnetism and then you have something which is called as the theory of seafloor spreading. And then you have the theory of convectional currents. Uh, various scientists came up with these theories. Say, for example, the Harry Hess comes up with the theory of convectional currents and uh, I think seafloor spreading is given by someone. And so a lot many theories come together and though a lot of criticism and a lot of lacunas in the theory of uh, Alfred Wegener, it should be believed that uh, the, the, the core of what Wegener had to say was however true. He was not able to explain it was the only flaw that it was in, in, a, in a scientific way, I would say. He tried to explain it in many ways, but he was not able to explain it in a scientific way. As a consequence, people said that uh, what Wagner is saying sh uh, should not be um, much to be believed as such. But eventually it came to fore that what the core of what Wagner had to say was something very serious. And by 1960s, they came up with a theory. And uh, interestingly, this is a theory which is not a theory given by uh, one individual. It's, it's a culmination of many, many theories of thousands of scientists working. And even today, believe me, thousands, okay, to the minimum, thousands of scientists in different corners of the world are working on this particular theory. This theory is called as the theory of plate tectonics. Okay, and uh, uh, each, each plate, as far as this plate tectonic theory is concerned, is supposed to be 100 kilometers thick. Now, here is a difference. Wegener says that his, uh, his, his, his surface is, is, is just the Sial and the Saima. That's only the crust. That's all put together 35 to 40 kilometers only. Plate tectonics is something happening in a much thicker way, okay? 100 kilometers. So that's the basic difference. But remember, the base is there in the uh, CDT. That's continent, continental drift theory uh, as such. Okay? 
and here is where we come to the diagram in front of you you'll see that if you mark all the earthquakes that keep on happening okay or, uh, and uh, you see that they show a peculiar pattern okay you'll see that uh, uh, you 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 see a pattern here I'll, I'll try to just enlarge it okay you see a pattern here you see a pattern here pattern here okay it, it is as it as if that there are certain areas which are more prone to earthquakes than any other areas as and these in plate tectonics were called as plates. These were called as plates. Now, these plates are all the crust. Remember, Wegener was speaking only about land. Okay, he was not speaking about oceans. Okay, uh, that's the limitation of technology at the time of Wegener. But with technology, we'll see that you have one plate, which is one large plate. This is the Pacific plate as such. And then you have the Australasian plate or Indo-Australian Indo plate as such. Nowadays, they say that uh, the Indian plate is separate and the Australian plate is separate. Then you have the Philippines plate here and so on and so forth. So all these plates are, are, are in moving. Okay? They, they, they are acting and interacting with each other. How do they act and interact? So this is a more clear picture. You see that you have so many plates around. Okay? The largest of it is the Pacific and you have the Philippine plate and you have the Cocos plate here, the Nazca plate. Okay? And then down here, you have the Antarctic plate and the arrows show how they are moving okay, in the Caribbean. You see that this complex is very sensitive. Okay, uh, if, if you ask me, sir, where have been the latest and the most uh, severest of earthquakes happening, I would say it's the coast of Peru and Chile, Chile basically because it's believed that uh, the Nazca plate is, is and the Cocos plate as well is being sandwiched between the Pacific and the South American plate. Okay, And that is why there is a lot of happening along this particular coast. The latest intensive earthquake happened uh, around 10 day, 10, a decade ago uh, in Peru. Okay, it's, it's going to be somewhere here. So these are the different plates and the crust of this planet is divided into these plates as said. Okay, now these are called as tectonic plates. Each of them is 100 kilometers thick. Okay, and uh, earthquakes occur when the plates rub against uh, each other as said. Okay, uh, as, as the earlier diagram, you'll see that you plot these. Um, uh, earthquakes and you get the margins of these plates. Now, what happens actually along these margins? Another view of uh, uh, the world ocean, uh, ocean floor. Okay, let us see how it is. You'll see this is the Pacific one. And you'll see that this is one prominent feature. Then in the Atlantic Ocean, in fact, this is a very prominent feature. This is called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. And interestingly, it's only Iceland where the Mid-Atlantic Ridge comes onto the land. Otherwise, it's completely submerged. Okay, you'll see that it continues. All this is linked. These ridges are linked from one uh, ocean to the other. You'll see that vaguely, faintly, but yes, surely they are linked into each other. That that yields a very important uh, conclusion that something has to happen in a dynamic way, and and or something happening somewhere is going to affect something happening somewhere else. So. These are tectonic plates, okay, and then say nearer view as such, okay. And uh, this is this is uh, the see how they measure the age of the rocks. When I said paleomagnetism, this is one thing, okay. This is another diagram showing the paleomagnetism. I'm running fast basically because we are going to visit this again uh, when we are back again. You'll see that this is how uh, what happens at the ridges. Okay, you'll see that volcanoes erupt, crust is being formed and uh, the older one is pushed away and new is being formed at the center where the volcanic magma is li uh, is, is rising here as such. Okay, this is something uh, which, which is very in interesting. This is called as paleomagnetism. We'll come back to that later. Okay, this leads to formation of two types of plates. Okay, if it's an oceanic plate, you'll have basalt. If it's a continental plate, if you have you'll have granite and andesite, which makes up uh, the continental plate. What is the difference and why the difference if the lava has to be the same? Oceanic plates obviously are, are uh, on, on say under a pressure of the water that covers the oceans as such. So under all that pressure, the lava that comes out, the sorry, the magma that comes out and spreads that lava is under a lot of pressure and this leads to a compaction. And that is why you'll see that basalt is much dense as compared to granite. Okay, you'll see that continental plates it's on land that these volcanoes occur and uh, that is why you'll see that it gets an immense amount of time to cool down 
okay and because it cools down very gradually you have a granite has a very granular structure you can immediately identify the grains in granite but because of the pressure of the water you see that and of course the temperature variations you'll see that uh, things happen very suddenly as far as oceanic plates is concerned and formation of basalt is concerned the only reason we are using this slide here okay we'll we'll look into the rocks and other aspects later okay now uh, those boundaries that we spoke about as far as these uh, the, the whole plate boundaries are concerned they act into each other in uh, uh, three different ways they they converge into each other they diverge from each other or they transform in the sense they 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 are called as convergent di boundaries or uh, margins they are called as divergent margins and they are called as transformed uh, plate boundaries as such okay what are these let's go into the details of this you'll see that this is the first one is transform okay it's happening within okay some parts move faster some parts move slower so uh, you'll see that uh, while they they supposed to be moving together some move faster some move slower and this is going to be the age edge where transform uh, boundary is going to be there now when when plates are going to be separated say what is happening as far as the mid oceanic ridge is concerned here let us say this is the atlantic ocean and this is the mid oceanic ridge okay uh, there is a continuous pouring of lava here and the older one is going to be stretching away from this okay and that is why it is called as a divergent plate okay now at while it is going to diverge somewhere it's going to converge somewhere and the heavier of them now this is land remember this is land granite this is uh, ocean this is basalt basalt is denser so it's going to go down as it goes down the pressure is again going to melt it and this melted thing will again come up so these are cycles which tend to happen regularly around us okay but that is this while this is divergent this is convergent okay here again you have convergent wherein it's going down and what comes up it melts the plate end the plate margin melts and then it comes back up and you're going to have volcanoes of course this is going to take uh, several millions of years to happen okay another way of looking at these boundaries this is how transformation see this is the transform boundary and let us just enlarge this here okay. this is the transform boundary okay while they are these two are going away from each other because of this push from here beneath this these are convectional currents so these are divergent and what happens to the other end is why they are diverging here somewhere they have to converge and the denser material has to go down in this convectional cycle so this is going to be a convergent boundary this is going to be a divergent boundary and this is going to be a transformed boundary okay so these are these boundaries another view of how and how where and how this is all happening you see that uh, this is the mid oceanic ridge the magma is rising here okay this is the oceanic lithosphere here okay and then this is going to be pushed down here is along this margin that you're going to have trenches these are called as trenches this is the convergent boundary and another interesting thing is this thing here these red dots that you can see all around here okay all the way into the asthenosphere way down okay these are plots of where various earthquakes have occurred nowadays of course we using seismographs and other techniques you can measure where exactly the focus of the earthquake was it was found that most of the focuses of majority of the earthquakes were along these boundary margins okay along convergent boundaries margins and how and why this is being pushed down as uh, as such okay some of this is going to melt and of course magma is going to be formed and it's going to come up here in this way and of course we're going to have this volcanism but what's important here if you plot all the earthquakes all along this okay, you identify a zone which is going to be very very prone to the earthquake as okay and this is called as the benioff zone okay this is known by the name of the scientist or seismologist i would call him benioff who who, who for the first time postulated that these are the zones from where actually the earthquakes are originating and that's why to honor him that is called as the benioff zone as such another view of what is happening okay you see is they have written himalayas and tibetan plateau here okay you're going to have the eurasian plate and japan trench here and of course something i spoke about the peru chile trench which is along the margin of the uh, nazca plate on one side and the south american plate on the other okay and uh, this is how plates tend to diverge and go away from each other
Okay, and this is how eventually a million years down the line, this is how the diversion will look. And some the same things was, and and then this is something very interesting hot spots. If you if you remember, I spoke about the Hawaii Islands and how the Hawaii Islands are are on the top of an high, hot spot, and while the plate moves, uh, you'll see that you have creation of so many. Uh, uh, mounds, I would rather say, of lava. Okay, and this is the geological trail of how the plate. You can easily identify in which direction the plate is moving. Okay, you'll see that it, it started from here and it has been moving like this all the way here. So the first evidence is here, and the last, the present day, it is here. Okay, this is how it would move. Okay, these arrows, it's moving this way. Okay, now why actually do the plates move? As I said, we are going to go into the details of this. So I'll not go into much of the details, but you have something which is called as slab pull, ridge rise, rises, and convection. We are going to come back to the details of this. A bigger picture, the same plates can be known here. Okay, you'll see that a new plate in addition is the Anatolian plate, uh, which is being referred to here. Let's see, this is the Anatolian plate. Okay, it's between the Asian plate and the Arabian plate, the so-called Arabian plate as such. You'll see that there is this white line which is traveling all the way here. Okay, this is called as the Somalian subplate. Okay, we'll go into the details of discussing that later. Okay, that brings us back into the history of the first of the uh, ways in which people try to study all these things. Okay. Uh, the Pangaea. Okay, if if you remember or if you have caught the words during the documentary of the continental uh, of of the geological scale, or when I was speaking about the geological scale as such, uh, it was around the Carboniferous period or the period just after that. That's the Paleozoic era that we had the Pangaea, and the Pangaea is to have been broken. Pangaea was the supercontinent at one particular point of time. Uh, please remember that it's not for for the first time that Pangaea, that that in the Pangaea phase, all the continents had come together. It is believed that it's at least two to three times before also that all the continents have come together to form a Pangaea and uh, they have split. I think the other day I posted a, a interesting uh, clip from uh, Facebook. If I have, if I have not, please remind me, I'll play, paste it again on our group as such. Before this, in fact, it is believed that all the continents uh, going through the science and the physics of all this, uh, they, they, they all of them come together at least once in one billion years. So if it is at least once in one billion years, if you, if you let, let aside the first billion years as the age, age of formation, second, third and fourth, okay, the fourth let us, fourth billion, let us say the fourth billion was the Pangaea. But then in that case, the first, there have been two more, Rodania 1 and Rodania 2. The continent, the single massive continent is called as Rodania 1 and Rodania 2. Instead of Rodania 3, we call it as the Pangaea. Okay, it was called as the supercontinent. Okay, it's it's basically, uh, uh, scientists have agreed that it could have been possible basically because uh, though these continents seem to be, uh, uh, say, say, separated by thousands of kilometers of waters of different oceans as such, uh, the fossils, the rocks, they, they tend to match in such a way that uh, you could you could see that well, um, it's, it's it could so be true that all these continents are were were one bit basically one mass landmass as such. Uh, there is one important thing that I wanted to uh, share with you all as as such that uh, when we say normally as when we say divide. We normally tend to divide it in the math mathematics sense. So when I'm going to say the Pangaea broke into two, two units, okay, there could possibly be a misconception that it broke into two parts of equal size. Let me tell you, they did not break into two parts of equal size. They broke into that's the Laurasia and the Gondwana. But the Gondwana was much much larger as compared to the Laurasia. The Laurasia was much smaller. It was only Europe and uh, Asia minus uh, India, etc. Remember that and uh, North America, all these three components put together. But the Gondwana was South America and Africa and Australia and India, however small it may be. And of course, Antarctica, all of them put together was the Gondwana. So uh, when we say division, 
please remember henceforth that it's not a mathematical division. Okay, the Laurasia is smaller as compared to the Gondwana. Okay, that's an interesting and important thing that we have to uh, keep in mind as such. Okay, uh, as I said, Wegner proposed this theory. Okay, and uh, we're going to come. This is this is Wegner, and he's in his study room and he's working intensively as such. Okay, this is how it is. It is supposed to have moved. We'll just try to play it once again. Let's see if it plays. Yesterday it did not play with the BA students, but let me see. Yeah, see, see how it is moving. I'll just play it again for you. Okay, so that's a very interesting thing to have happened to all these things. And uh, now you'd see that it's a GIF image, so it will keep on playing around. Uh, yeah, it stopped. So, uh, Alfred Wegener. Okay, in fact, it is it is so said that uh, he was with his students, and his students were were cutting out the edges of the continents. And they said that, uh, uh, sir, if you see very carefully, uh, if if you push the continents into each other, they could probably fit into each other. Wegener. Uh, initially, of course, shooed away their concepts saying that nothing like that happens. But uh, when he concentrated on the same thing, okay, he too found, and in fact, when he proposed it later, a lot of scientists said that uh, this is this is all uh, crap and uh, uh, nothing like this is happening. But then Wegener was very convinced about the fact that uh, what, what he had thought and what uh, thought that his students had initiated could very well be true and uh, if it is true he needs to go into the details of what uh, uh, what eventually was to come out as the continental drift theory we'll speak about the postulates first okay to to see every theory is going to have a postulate every theory is going to have an evidence and of course every theory is going to have its own criticism as such so we're going to go step by step let us see how much we can complete today as far as the postulates are concerned Remember that Wegener initially was a, a, a climatologist. He was studying climates in different parts. And then he said that uh, uh, there, there, there were some patches on different continents which did not match to their uh, location, which did not match to their location. Say, for example, in Sahara, if I find glacial deposits, say, for example, in India, southern part of India, which is nearer to the equator, I have glacial deposits. Uh, it, it does not confirm to the fact that you just can't believe that somewhere in Sahara you're going to have glacier, somewhere in India you're going to have glaciers as such. So there could be two possibilities that uh, either the climates have been changing for different regions or the continents have been moving. He said that as far as my study goes, he says, the climates have not changed much. Later on that also was a bit uh, difficult for him to prove. But he said that as far as my knowledge goes, climates don't change. So the only option that we are left with, with all these anomalies that we find around us, is that uh, possibly the continents are moving. Okay, Of the two possibilities, continents move or climates change. He says climates don't change, so he says continents are on the move. Actually, what he should have said is both of them are partially true. Okay, And this is one of the major criticism that Alfred Wegener faced later in time. Uh, as then he says that uh, all continents, if the crust he says is made up of two layers, Sial and the Saima, he postulates that all the continents, the landmass is the Sial, and all the ocean is the Saima. He says that the Sial is lighter and less dense, and that is why it is floating on the Saima. Okay, this is the Saima, this is the Sial, this is the ocean, this is the land. So it's 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 there, okay, and uh, he says that this 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 is the scenario, and he says that uh, these these continents are going to move. Some of them are going to move, going to move towards the equator, and some of them are going to move westward. Okay, the North and South America, he said, moves westward, but and Africa etc. moves towards the equator, and Asia from the north move towards the equator as such. He uses certain terms as such okay, when he, he is presenting his particular theory. He uses a term called as jigsaw fit. Jigsaw fit is fitting into each other like this. This is a jigsaw fit. 
okay, perfectly fitting into each other. Jigsaw is the word which was used by Alfred Wegener. He says that continents are in a jigsaw fit into each other. Then he speaks about the drift. The continents are moving. Okay, he visualizes them to be moving as if they are drifting on a denser surface, and that's why a drift. And then he uses another word which is called as polar wandering. Now, what polar wandering is something we are going to come to. And then we also uses a German term called as Polflucht. That is the the flight from the poles. Now, what this bit actually means is something that we need to take up uh, when we meet tomorrow. Uh, I'll I'll stop sharing right now, and uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll come back to this. And uh, if you have any questions of whatever we have done till now. Uh, we could uh, speak about them or else I'll wait for a couple of minutes and then uh, we'll call it a day. So, um, yeah, you can type your questions and I'll just repeat what we have done today. Crustal theories are various and uh, one of the earlier ones was the tetrahedral theory and then you have the theory of isostasy uh, followed by Wegener, but uh, Wegener uh, theory was 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 not very confirming as such and that's why you'll find a lot of criticisms we'll see into the criticisms tomorrow but eventually you had supporting theories like the plate uh, sorry the paleomagnetism theory and the sea floor spreading etc leading to what was to be called as the theory of plate tectonics and uh, the plate tectonics right from 1960s to today so it's um akshata joshi is asking a question what is earthquake in depth? Uh, what is earthquake in depth? I think uh, you mean to ask me what is the depth of an earthquake? You see that earthquakes tend to be qualified as per their depths as such. Subduction zone. Okay. Earthquakes basically now you'll see that when if we say that it's an adjustment of energy and um, plates you see that this release of energy could take place at any level. It could be very shallow to the surface or it could be very deep. But let me tell you that the deepest of the earthquakes recorded have been not more than 800 kilometers from the surface. So you'll see that it does not go deep into the mantle. It is somewhere in the asthenosphere itself. Okay, deepest of the earthquakes. And then from 800 on downwards, say 700, 500, 400, 300. So you classify them up till 300. You're going to call them as semi-shallow. And, and beyond 300 kilometers, you're going to call them as uh, uh, the, the deep earthquakes, deep seated earthquakes, as they are called as such. Okay, subduction. Okay, you'll see that when you're going to have two plates coming into each other, if uh, one of them is going to be dense, say, let us say this is going to be the denser earth, uh, one as such. Okay, you'll see that the denser one, as far as laws of physics, is going to go down. Now, this zone where it is going down, okay, this zone, okay, this face and this phase when they are touching each other. This is called as the subduction zone because it is going down here. It's called as subduction. Now, it is not going to be called as, uh, say, coming up basically because the, the height of the continent remains as it is. It's the ocean floor that is going to go down and it's going to melt here. It's going to melt here. Sorry, I'll just remove this. It's going to melt here and then it is going to come up as an earthquake, uh, 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 volcanic mountain once again. So this is the process of how uh, it happens as such. Okay. Um, I hope that understands, uh, uh, explains your question as such. Um, and, and, and that should end what I am uh, supposed to be doing. I have no other questions for the day. So I will, I will stop here. We'll meet tomorrow. And uh, the other discussions regarding the documentary, etc., we'll take them up on the WhatsApp group. Remember what I have said as far as your uh, uh, credentials are concerned. Okay, they are different to say. Uh, one student said that it's not my Gmail ID. It will not be basically be because if if there are going to be four people by the name Manoj Kumar, everybody is not going to have their uh, ID with a Manoj Kumar. So it would be Manoj Kumar 001. It could be Manoj Kumar 002. The third one, Manoj Kumar 003, or any other conve conventional ID uh, that the computer or rather the system generates would be your uh, credential as far as attending uh, official classrooms are concerned. Uh, that's all for the day. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow, same time. 
and of course we'll continue understanding how wegner tried to uh, convince people about his particular theory uh, that's all thank you very much uh, stay home stay safe